everyone and welcome back. Today is all about shoes. We're going to be looking at shoe styles from around 1820 to 1920 that would have been common and popular in America, the UK, and all over Europe. Now this of course doesn't include very specific regional styles, there are so many of those, but this is kind of covering the general common fashion. This is stuff that would have been seen in stores all over the place. Shoes are mass produced in sizes by the time this 100 year period starts, and there are so many options out there in terms of style and color and fabric, everything you can imagine. So there's not going to be one style that is the style in any particular decade, year, or even season. There are going to be lots of different options, but very often they do have a lot of similarities, and there certainly are certain shapes or colors, heel heights and styles, toe shapes and styles, that are particularly popular and really indicative of an era. I've wanted to do this video for a very long time, but I've been holding off purely because I wanted to make sure I had good examples. It's one thing to show you pictures of shoes that are perfectly preserved in a museum, sitting on a clean white background from one angle, still shot. It's just not going to really give you the sense of the shape the mass, the weight, the flexibility, any of the elements of these shoes that really go towards more than just a simple silhouette. So I have been putting this off knowing that I've been gradually collecting antique shoes for about the last two years. I don't have a perfect collection yet. I certainly don't have absolutely everything covered, but I have quite a few pairs at this point in time. And I really try to choose pairs to collect that were really indicative of the era they're from, things that I could put exact dates on or that have really great representation in advertisements of the era, anything that I thought would just be a good example as a teaching tool. Not necessarily the most perfect and pretty and well-preserved examples, but examples that would help us learn more about the time period or the person that wore them or anything else. So that's what I've been gradually amassing for the last two years, and I am finally going to share that with all of you. We're going to start today with this pair from around 1818 to 1819. This particular pair is a perfect example of the transition that is occurring during this time. We have a shoe that has an almond toe and it also has a little heel in the back. In this case, it's a stacked heel with a really petite round shape, no particular curves to it. And what makes this particularly unique to this era is the fact that it's a transition time period for both of these elements. So the heel is on its way out. It has been transitioning out for the last 20 years. Plenty of examples do survive that have wedge heels and little curved wooden heels. But as we reach the 1820s, the heel will pretty much disappear for a while. Same thing goes with the toe shape. The almond toe has been in style for a good 10-15 years at this point, but it's going to transition to the square toe, or rather it has already started to transition to the square toe. So this is a remnant of the very last bit of its age, but it's still a perfect example of many of the features of shoes of this era. You can see the very narrow waist that we have in the middle here that really flares out to fit the foot. You can see that this is a symmetrical shoe, meaning that it is straight last, it doesn't have right or left. But as you can see from the wear pattern here, as they are worn, they turn into right and left. So you can't really transition back and forth after that point. As for the rest of the styling of the shoe, it is really typical of the era with a very high, what we call vamp, covering a large portion of the foot. These little ties up at the top out of a silk ribbon. This is also a little decorative bow here. The fact that this does not have eyelets is pretty typical for the era. It's bound in a silk ribbon and it is incredibly soft. There's no structure in the toe. And back here in the heel, the only structure that we have is this little piece of leather that's sort of offering a little bit of grip support and helps protect this seam from popping open as it gets so much stress. So this is a very lightweight, almost ballet slipper-like pair of shoes. It's very straight in its bottom line, even with the heel, it's still a very straight line to the bottom. And that really gives us a great example of this time period. 
in contrast, this is a reproduction pair based on an original pair from 1816. We can date the original pair so closely because of the label inside of it. But this particular pair has the flat sole that we'll come to find to be more common later, and it also has the square toe, which becomes so very popular for so many decades. You'll notice, in particular, this square is very narrow. The width of the actual foot versus the width of the square is notable here, as we'll really start to see that change throughout the next few decades. But this is a great example of the contrast from a different style of shoe from the same era as the first pair that is still a fair bit different, showing that there's more than one style going on at the same time. This little pair of flats fits perfectly into the 1830s. You can see that the square toe and lack of heel has totally taken hold. The square is very straight and blunt. Corners are pretty sharp, all things considered. The underside, you can see just how wide that square has become as well. It's not quite as wide as the joint to the foot, but it's also a very narrow shoe, so it might be a little exaggerated there. The heel is completely gone. The shoe itself is very thin and flat and lightweight. There's very little structure built into this. Even the uppers are just one thin layer of leather, almost no other infrastructure. So these would very much feel like ballet slippers. The vamp for this time period is about midway up. You sometimes see higher ones, and for evening shoes or dance pumps, you'll see them sit much lower. This general silhouette will carry us from the late 1820s into the 1840s, where things will start to shift just a little bit. This pair of side lacing boots would have been immensely common from the 18-teens well into the 1860s, but this pair likely dates from the early 1840s. One of the ways that we can date it more specifically, even though it doesn't have a lot of really defining features for its style, is the fact that they are right and left, meaning that we have started to gradually, just barely, transition back to the right and left that used to be used. This is evocative of the 1840s, because there were a lot of books coming out in that era that were talking about the concern over foot health. Part of the reason why this concern started up is that they were really pushing for heavier, sturdier shoes during this time. This is still a very lightweight pair, the sole is still very thin and flat, we don't have our heel back yet, and it looks nearly paper thin along the edge. However, there is a little bit more structure to it. Because of the leather at the tip of the toe, which actually continues up to that point, and because of this heel structure which continues all the way up to there underneath, there's actually a fair amount of structure and stiffness to the shoe, which is rather new for women's shoes. They are gradually moving away from that very lightweight, flexible ballet slipper style that we're used to. It's just a wonderful common example. It's made out of wool for the upper, and when we come down to the toe, I find this particularly interesting in the fact that it's not too overly squared. It's a little bit rounded out. It seems to be a short trend in that era. It's still a little flat, but it's not nearly as harsh as some of the shoes before it and after it. However, you will still notice that the width of the shoe at the widest point is still a fair bit wider than the toe is. But this particular pair of boots is one of my favorites in my collection because it is such a perfect example of a popular style for quite a few decades. The exact shape of the foxing and designs on it will also alter, but the concept is still fairly consistent and it's one of the most popular styles of day-to-day -day walking shoes that you can find for the first half of the 19th century. As we move forward into the 1850s and 60s, the high heel does return. This pair of Oxfords is likely from the late 1850s or early 1860s range. It does have its heel back. This pair has a heavier sole weight to it. It has a fairly sturdy heel despite being relatively high. It also has the really square toe that is so true to this era. And you can see it's just a little bit rounded there. Not everything was a completely blunt, sharp angle for these shoes. But you can see just how narrow that waist is across the center. And the fact that we're getting pretty close to that being the same measurement the whole way down. There's not as much of a difference between the ball of the foot 
and the width of the toe at this point in time. It's gradually getting wider and wider. The uppers of the shoe have a bit more structure in them, though the toe is very soft. You can see the structure sort of pushing out and creasing around the back part of the shoe, so it has a very stiff and hardened heel cup back there. There is nothing particularly expensive about this shoe, but the embroidery really does a lot to elevate it. In part, this is because women's skirts were necessarily getting shorter just yet. They were pretty long and full in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, but as we reach towards the 1860s, you start to see the cage crinoline, which helps to hold the skirts away from the body without filling it out with petticoats, and will more often show a little bit of that shoe. Just a smidge of your toe might pop out the front. So the shoes are starting to show, and they really want to show them off. So details like this embroidery are becoming more and more common. The opening is much longer and lower on the foot than those earlier examples, and it really resembles what we consider a modern-day Oxford in many ways. These boots are a reproduction of an original pair from 1864 that was made and purchased in Paris. They are a great example of very fashionable shoes from this era. As you can see, they have gold buttons, they have a bunch of cording and tassels at the ankle, bows at the toe, and you can only assume that she expected that these would be shown, that you would see these peeking out from below her petticoats. Otherwise, that's a lot of detail and work that will never be seen by anyone but the wearer. As we move towards the bottom, you can see the toe is nearly as wide as the joint of the foot. We're almost there. It's still a fairly square shape, a little bit rounded, but not too much. And the heel is that same fashionable sort of inch to inch and a half range. This one is an opera heel shape, so it's actually made out of stacked leather and has a little bit of a nice curve to it there, but it's not a very high heel. However, because heels seem to be establishing themselves as the norm, they are starting to adjust the construction for it. So this shoe, as you can see here in the middle, has a fair bit of curve, and that is because there's some inner structure that keeps it from flexing quite as much as some of those earlier shoes do. It is still fairly lightweight, especially when you look at the upper. There is nothing in the toe happening just yet, and it's still very, very soft to the touch, even if the sole is starting to gain some structure to it. In contrast, we have this other pair of boots from the 1860s, which is decidedly not fashionable. And that's to say that they are very practical. It's got a much thicker sole. It's actually a welted construction style, so that way it's particularly thick. It has the same height of heel, but it is a bit sturdier in its overall size, and the actual structure of the shoe is not going to flex very much at all. Rather than leaving the standard square toe, they raised it up. They put this curve into it, and they built out a toe box, so that way it can't collapse in on itself. This is not something that you commonly see in fashionable examples of this era, so it's a really, really wonderful example of someone trying to create a very healthy shoe that's good for the foot, at least what they thought was good for the foot. Despite the fact that it is very practical, it has metal eyelets, it still has this lovely scallop design at the top, so it's not without some sense of decoration in some way. And even with all of that structure, it still has a fairly dainty footprint to it. It is decidedly right and left, there is no question about that, and it has a very similar toe shape to the 1864 example we just looked at. So that doesn't necessarily have to change for them to be healthy or practical everyday shoes. They're just going to be made out of different materials that are a little bit more sturdy. Swinging back to a more fashionable style of shoe, this pair of boots is from 1867 actually date these exactly because on the sole there is a stamp that specifies the Exposition Universelle, which took place in Paris in 1867. So this was a pair of boots that was meant to be shown off in that essentially World's Fair. And you'll notice first off this little panel here, which is not in the best condition, it was elastic. And this style of shoe, what they called Congress boots, came in in the late 1840s and was just all the rage for quite some time. But boots like this, boots that laced up, boots that buttoned clothes were very popular along with Oxford styles and pumps. Pumps weren't necessarily the most practical for walking around every single day in, 
boots like this could do a lot of service. They could be for walking or they could be for more fancy events. So you got a lot of choices out of one pair of boots. They are a cotton material, which is increasingly popular as the century progresses. For examples like this, they do have that little tassel at the ankle, like our 1864 example, and a bow, though this one's more of a little bow rosette, down at the toe. The heel shape is very similar, though a little bit higher to our 1864 example. And you can see this is actually a wooden heel covered in fabric rather than stacked leather. The sole shape is also very similar to the 1864 example, though a bit of a wider waist there. And the width of the shoe is fairly consistent the whole way down. We are starting to see a little bit more curve here. That's one of those interesting features of the late 1860s into the 1870s. You start to lose the square toe ever so gradually. This pair of pumps dates to likely the early to mid 1870s. They have lost a little bit of their luster over the years and are fairly worn, but originally this leather would have had an almost metallic bronze purple finish to it, which was particularly popular throughout the late part of the 19th and into the early 20th centuries. And you can see here, the style of pumps that would have been very popular for dancing, for evening events, has a lot more flexibility to the sole than some of those walking boots did. And the toe is still very, very soft. The back does certainly have a lot more structure though. The bottom of the shoe is a great example of styles of the 1870s. Still has a little bit of that square toe. It's rounded out a fair amount. Interestingly enough, this is one of my best examples of being able to see the stitch work that runs through the middle of the sole to make a lot of these different styles of shoes. So this would have been done as a turn shoe, meaning made wrong side out and turned right side out, so it needs to be flexible enough to do that in the shoemaking process. But there's still some stiffness here under the foot, so it's not completely back to the flat style that ran completely straight of the earlier part of the century. There's a fair bit of curve to it, a little bit of support and structure, but this is meant to be a very flexible, easy to wear shoe for evening events. The heel here, another example of a wooden heel. You can see we're still binding in silk ribbons here, bows down over the main part of the toe, incredibly common and popular. And this is one of the first examples I have of these little steel cut beads that you're going to start seeing more and more on evening shoes. They just glitter so wonderfully, even in the lowest of light. So this is a perfect example of an evening pair of shoes. They certainly still had boots in this era and came in so many different styles. Some were incredibly decorative, some were very plain, but they were really starting to get in to decorating their shoes more and more in this time period. This bow that you see on this example is just the start of a lot of effort to do embroidery and bows and beading and extra decorative work to really make those shoes pop as you're starting to see them more regularly out from underneath women's skirts. This pair from the 1880s is one of my favorite examples of the combination of style and practicality. They are out of a very simple black leather but they don't dispense with the decorations just because they are a more practical construction and weight and material. They still have the really interesting cutout design over the vamp here, and they have scallops around the top edge, little buttons on the side. So they have some wonderful decoration going on, despite the fact that they are a fairly plain and practical shoe otherwise. They clearly saw a lot of wear and tear over the years. This pair shows that very rounded toe we definitely don't see a square shape to it anymore, but it's not really narrow. It's not an almond shape, it's not a pointed shape. It's a fairly blunt round toe at this point in time. Definitely right left. You can see a still fairly narrow waist in that area there. The heel is a stacked leather. That's a curved style, that sort of opera heel French style. Curves back out just a little bit, still has a straight front to it. You can see a nice curve under the arch of the foot. It's not too extreme, but it's definitely not a straight line. And it does have a little bit of flexibility. But I think that might be more from the fact that this pair of shoes has been so broken in than it is the fact that it's a very lightweight or unstructured leather. So the 1880s is a great time for both boots and oxfords. This isn't quite an oxford, but it does fall into the category of shoes that cover way up on the foot. 
we will definitely still see those dancing pumps for evening events, but shoes like this that are practical for everyday use and wear are exceedingly popular and come in so many different styles during this time, some of which have the most interesting design work on them. This pair of evening pumps is from around 1890. They have a round or almost almond toe shape to them, and you'll start to see the transition away from not just square toe, towards a very elongated toe, which is going to eventually come to a point in this new decade. The heel back here is also a great example of an 1890s style heel, where it's very low and flat. It is very long in comparison to its width. So it's one of those clues of shoes of this era. There's not a lot of curve here. Not surprisingly, it does curve up at the toe, which is, again, typical of this era to not see it be completely flat, but there's not a ton of curve under the foot because the heel is just that low. Well, this is a dancing shoe, evening shoe, or something else of that formal nature, plenty of examples of boots and oxfords and other styles really, really show up in this era, as we will see shortly. <laughs> Just look at these boots. They are so very indicative of the mid 1890s. That pointed toe and that low heel just give everything absolutely away. You can see that they really love in this time period doing all sorts of interesting cut work and scroll designs in leather. This is actually a fairly simple example of that. Some get incredibly elaborate. Boots commonly lace up just above the ankle and really accentuate the difference of the narrowness of the ankle and the extended length of that foot. Because of course you're not expected that your foot fits into that space. The foot itself stops by that point and this is just an extension much further on. The sole is fairly sturdy weight. These are a good walking pair of shoes. Beautiful low heel, but still has a little bit of curve to it. This is also an era where you start to see broguing and other details like that in shoes regularly. Broguing is this little series of holes that runs up the line here. Sometimes little holes will create designs like flowers or other geometric things on the toes. And this era is just so distinct for its toe shape and general silhouette with the low heel. If you've ever seen bicycle boots, this is the era that they really came around in. Everything about shoes in this era is very distinct, very aggressive almost. They almost feel tailored and masculine compared to some of the more dainty, lightweight, and decorative styles of the earlier decades. Up next, we have what are pretty much the shoes of the 1900s, at least from a modern perspective. There are, of course, lots of other styles. But this particular pair, which is a Sorosis pair, a very popular brand in this time, this cutwork with the beads on the front is something that is immensely popular and indicative of the time. You can see that it straps over and buttons closed together there, though sometimes they are separate straps. The heel is much higher than we saw in the mid-1890s. This style is coming in as early as 1898 and will continue well into the 19-teens. And it's a much higher heel. It's a French style heel. And you can see the toe here. It's not nearly as pointed as the mid 1890s, but it is definitely extended pretty far past the foot. It makes the foot look very, very narrow on the toes. Though the expectation is of course that your foot itself doesn't actually extend that far. The arch under the foot is very pronounced and they also really love adding a little bit of curve back in under the heel so it's not running straight up like some of those earlier examples, but it creates such an absolutely beautiful curve under the foot for that arch there, which we're adding more and more structure into. There's definitely not gonna be any bending of the structure in here. Sometimes the shanks, which is what actually creates the structure inside, are made out of metal as of this era. So they're definitely getting tougher and tougher. We have a lot of strength back here in the heel cup, and there is some reinforcement at the toe as well, even under all of that beading. So this style of shoe, though it is a plain black leather, would still be wonderful for a lot of purposes because of the glittery beads that are showing off the entire front part of the foot. But this would be a fairly practical pair of shoes as well as you can see how much the person that originally wore these loved them. 
this pair of evening shoes takes us into the 19-teens. It's a great example of the metallic brocade that was incredibly popular in the 19-teens and 1920s. And this pair is definitely uh, a bit tarnished, so it no longer has the glitter and gold sheen that it used to, but you can still see just how much detail and sparkle would have been there in that time. This is definitely more of an evening pair of shoes, not just because of the metallic brocade, but also the fact that it's fairly open and strappy. Shoes of this era are becoming much more common as daily wear items, but Oxfords and boots are still incredibly popular in the 19-teens. So shoes like this would have been much more practical for evening wear than day wear. The same toe shape as that earlier pair before, very narrow waist that so you can actually see the two nails here that would hold the extra structure that is an extra piece of leather on the interior to keep that beautiful curve under the arch of the foot there. This is a great example of one that has a little bit of a bubble to it. There are definitely other examples that are much more extreme, but that addition of the structure in the toe cap area means that you can get some pretty interesting shapes there. This pair would have been worn probably for more fashionable and fancy dresses rather than everyday wear, even though they definitely have seen their fair share of wear and tear, possibly just a lot of dancing. They are a perfect example of the colonial revival style that came in during this time. Now this is nothing what a colonial shoe from the 18th century would have looked like, but it has the curvy Louis heel, it has the buckle in front, has a large tongue, much larger than it would have been, and while the buckle is certainly not functional, in fact, there actually is an entire strap and button behind this massive tongue, so just how not functional that is. But it's one of the more trendy fashions of that particular decade. They go through so many different styles and so many different ways of approaching shoes in this era. Hemlines have risen and shoes are incredibly visible and people want to experiment and have fun. As we round our way into the 1920s, the boot is on its way out. Now that doesn't mean that it didn't have a very exciting explosion of an exit. Some of the most interesting boot styles come out of the 19-teens and 1920s, before shoes and oxfords really take over as day-to-day -day wear for most women. Boots like this one, with beautiful and intricate cutouts in the front, or tango boots, are all present in the 19-teens and early 1920s. This example that I have here has all of these intricate little straps and buttons, but is clearly meant to be an everyday walking shoe. This pair was worn hard. It used to have some sort of bow across the front as well that's no longer there, but the staples remain. It was not exactly the most expensively made shoe, but it's pretty intricate and interesting. The heel, well, that's been walked through to the point where it's starting to change shape and nearly walked off. The sole of the shoe has been worn down to its stitches and warped and shifted. It's a great example of just an everyday boot style as boots were becoming the less and less common option. Though this pair of Oxfords is reminiscent of the 1890s, they are in fact from the late 19-teens. This particular style is just as aggressive as it was before, and that might be part of the purpose. They have the same very long, extended pointed toe, which makes the shoe look very narrow and the foot very long, but this time it's much straighter along the bottom edge. It doesn't flare up as much as it did in the 1890s. The heel in this case is obviously quite different. It's a much higher Cuban heel. It's a very sturdy style, but much, much higher. Therefore, you still have a really nice curve under the bottom of the foot. The uppers are very similar to what we saw in the 1890s with the more masculine tailored appearance to them. They have all the broguing and all of the leather work, a little bit of broguing on the toe there as well. So this style is definitely reminiscent of the popular styles from 20 years earlier. So we're already starting to see some styles repeat. The 19-teens definitely loved hearkening back to older styles. Our final example on the timeline takes us perfectly into the 1920s. This pair of shoes would have been wonderful for evening wear, other fashionable styles. This is not something you can necessarily wear for day wear as well. Not only are they a ivory suede, they're going to show dirt pretty easily, but they're also really cut open. There's all this space. We're suddenly exposing the entire side of the shoe here. That's a very new concept for this era. 
and you can see just how high that beautiful heel is. So much curve under the foot from the heel continuing down through the arch of the foot. The toe shape is more of an almond shape. It's a little bit round though. You can see that there's a little more height to this round toe than there was in previous decades. There's still a lot of structure built into the shoe even though there's so little of it comparative to other eras. And you can see some of the beautiful detailing on the front of the shoe, very geometric, very art deco, really wonderful example of the 1920s. And to top it all off, it's a name brand shoe. It's a Perugia. And this was considered a very high-end brand. This particular shoe designer was creating new styles and new concepts that other designers were copying for mass market production. So it rounds out our path of going through shoes just perfectly. But that's what really continues with us for the rest of the 21st century and into modern day. It's just constantly looking back at older styles, things that had been done in the 19th century, and coming up with new ways of looking at them, deciding whether the heel is going to get bigger or smaller, taller or shorter, whether the toe is going to be more pointed or square or rounded, whether or not we're going to be all about open pumps, whether or not boots or tied oxfords are going to be the trend. It's the same stuff that they really developed out of the 19th century that just repeats over and over and over again for all of the coming decades. So it's terribly interesting to look at that 100 year span of shoes and to see how much it constantly reflects in all of our current and modern shoe styles.